of Philippians tonight, the book of Philippians, please, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we'll read at verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 10, and you can follow with me if you would. Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. <clears throat> beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Father, again, we have gathered in this place and we thank you, Lord, for the good service we had this morning. Thank you for the soul that was saved. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for your kindness and mercies to us. And Father, we thank you for this evening service and for those who have come out. Thank you for those who are watching online and those who are listening on the radio. Help them uh, to receive a blessing as well. And Father, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, <clears throat> you would open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of everyone here and everyone watching and listening, that we might receive the things of God that would honor you and glorify your Son, that would encourage us and edify us, and, Father, win the loss to Christ. We'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Paul, that great apostle to the Gentiles, rehearses for us his family heritage, and his religious pedigree. All the things that a man could be proud of for his reputation, and all the things that a man could trust in for salvation, the Apostle Paul thought he had. Verses 5 and 6 put Paul in the upper crust of Jewish society. According to Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, Paul had been taught by the great Jewish scholar Gamaliel. And Paul was a man with all the right connections. He was a man with friends in prominent places. And yet we find him in verse 8 telling us that he counted it all as loss. He counted it all as nothing compared to knowing Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. Look at verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Not only did he say he counted them but loss, but he counted them as dung. He said, knowing Jesus Christ far surpasses anything I had in life, and everything I will ever have in life. Now dung is not something to be prized, or valued, it's not something that you towed out to impress people with. And yet in verses 4 and 5 and 6, that's exactly what he was doing. He was listing his pedigree and uh, his, his uh, family tree and all the things that uh, a man could use to lift himself up. And he said, but it's all done. Paul addressing the superiority of faith in Christ over everything else in life. And when it was time to meet his creator, Paul was glad that he was not going to meet God in his own supposed human righteousness or the righteousness that comes by religious observance, but by the righteousness of Christ through faith. Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. By faith. You see, there is our own righteousness, a righteousness that we ascribe to ourselves. 
It's empty. It's nothing. It's meaningless. There is a righteousness that we ascribe to ourselves by keeping the law or keeping this and doing that. It's all empty. It's all nothingness as far as righteousness is concerned. Paul said, that's what I had. He said, but now I know Christ and now I have a real righteousness, a genuine righteousness. I have the righteousness of God. Now, my friend, you can have the righteousness of your own self or you can have the righteousness of the law or you can have the righteousness of God. They're not the same. The righteousness of God comes by faith in Christ. You see, we see righteousness in human terms. But Paul did not want to rely on the faulty human understanding of righteousness that comes through works. He wanted to have the true righteousness that comes from God and is procured only by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All other religions boast in human goodness or human accomplishment, but not Christianity. There is a righteousness that only God can give. And this is the righteousness that Paul wanted and had by faith in Christ. Realize this. Paul had to turn his back on the family religion to become a Christian. Paul had to turn his back on his Jewish family to become a Christian. Paul had to turn his back on his Jewish nation in order to become a Christian. You understand? It wasn't like today. For Paul to turn from Judaism to Christianity was an astounding thing. It really cost him something. Paul had met Jesus, and now nothing else mattered. He had met truth. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And when he met truth, when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, he also met the way, didn't he? You see, Paul had been following a way. He'd been following the way of his family religion. He'd been following the way of his national religion. But now he found not a way, he found the way, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he found the truth, the truth made him free from all the things he was counting on in verses 5 and 6. If you would have met Paul in verses 5 and 6, you'd said, Well, his name was Saul then, and you'd say, Saul, uh, are you going to heaven? Well, yes, sir, I think so. Why? And he listed all those things. Those were the things he was counting on. But when he met Jesus Christ and understood that salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he realized all that stuff he was counting on would have let him down in the end. And he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and said, all that stuff doesn't matter. It's all but dung to me. It's all loss. Paul had a personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. And he was never the same. One day I had a personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. And I've never been the same. I did not physically see the glory of God like the Apostle Paul. I did not physically hear the voice of God as did Paul. But I did see Christ with the eye of faith. And I heard his voice in the word of God. And when you encounter the truth face to face, and your mind and your heart are open, there is a releasing of freedom to the soul and rejoicing of the heart to which no physical experience can compare or compete. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When you know Jesus, you're free. You're free from the family religion. You're free from the national religion. You're free from your own personal good works. You're free from all that junk that you were trying to heap up, to climb up on to get to heaven. You're free. You're free from superstition. You're free from religion. You're free from philosophy. You're free from the wisdom of the world. When you meet the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read the truth, the very written word of God, it makes you free. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to watch the news and know the truth. 
It's a wonderful thing to hear all the bad things that are going on in the world and know the truth. I'm free. What are you going to threaten me with? I'm free. Paul knew this freedom, this salvation, this wonderful relationship with Christ, and it was based upon faith. And because of it, he writes verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul wanted to know Jesus better and experience resurrection power in his life. There was a power. It's called resurrection power, the power of the resurrection. There is a power that's beyond all power known to humankind. It's the power of God to raise the dead. It's the power of resurrection. Man cannot create or handle such power. He doesn't know, he knows no such power. Paul said, that's the kind of power I want to know. He said, I want to know the power of God in my life. I want to know the power of the resurrection. The power that goes far beyond the feeble powers of reformation or rehabilitation or reclamation. He wanted to know the power that could raise the dead. And he wanted that to be operating in his personal life. And he reached forth and he pressed forward. What is this power of the resurrection? What practical power can it bring to our everyday lives? Well, the power of the resurrection is, number one, power over sin. The power of the resurrection is power over sin. What is it that claims the souls of men? What legitimate claim does hell have upon the human soul? The power of sin. The Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And someone might ask, well, what sin? What sin con condemns a person to hell? What sin uh, is it that, that causes us to deserve this eternal torment? Any sin. Pick one. You say, well, how many sins? One. And the Bible says all have sinned. All have sinned. If you only sinned one time in your life, you're condemned. Only once. Maybe when you were a little baby, maybe when you were a little child, you told a lie to your mom, and that's all you ever did, all your, all your existence. Guess what? You're condemned. Why? Because you sinned. And all have sinned. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Let me ask you a question. How many hairs do you have to find in your soup before you send it back? One. You see, your sin is the hair in the soup. I mean, why don't you just eat around the hair? You can't, right? You can't. Because all you see, there's a big bowl of soup, but all you see is the hair, right? It's disgusting. As natural man, all God sees is the hair. You're the bowl of soup, and all God can see is the hair, and it's disgusting. Your sin is disgusting to God. So you don't just remove the hair, do you? Oh, honey, look, there's a hair in my soup. Oh, I'll just take it out, and I'll go ahead and eat the soup. If you do, I need to talk to you after the service. You need counseling. <laughs> what do you do? You want a new bowl of soup, right? What does the Bible say? If any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. You see, God just doesn't, he just doesn't just remove the hair. He get, makes you a whole new bowl of soup. You're a new creature. The Bible has a verse that I believe demonstrates this point. It's, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. And here's what it said. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Now, in the old days, there were people who were called apothecaries. 
and they would make compounds. Let's say uh, your physician had given you a prescription for an ointment, and it was for your face. And so you would take the prescription to the apothecary, and he would get this ingredient and that ingredient and a few other things. He'd put them all in a mortar with a pestle. And he would grind it all together, you see? And he would add it until the, he was making an ointment. And he moves away from his job, and a couple of flies fly by, and they end up in the ointment. And he comes over, and he sees the flies in there, and he goes, Oh, man, I don't want to throw out all this ointment. I'll just grind them right in. I'll just roll them right in. Nobody will ever know the difference. And so you come and you get your ointment and you take it home, and pretty soon it starts to stink, right? As the flies or dead bodies are decaying right in your ointment. And one day you open that jar up and, whoo, honey, this ointment, smell that ointment. Oh, that's horrible. That's terrible. And you say, well, it looks okay, but it stinks. What do you do? You just put it on your face anyway? No, you're not going to use that ointment. Why? Something's wrong with that ointment. You can't see what's wrong with that ointment, but there's something in that ointment that makes it unusable, that makes it rotten. You know what? Your sin is the fly in the ointment. You can look good on the outside. You can sound good on the outside. But inside are dead flies that are causing the apothecary to stink. In other words, our sin causes us to stink in the nostrils of God. And you're not going to use that. That is unacceptable. So what do you do? You get a brand new jar of ointment. Those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior are brand new joys of ointment. And we have a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. Why? Because he's taken our sins away from us. And he has taken them as, uh, removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he's buried them in the depths of the deepest sea. The Bible says he's put them behind his back. So he won't see them or remember them anymore. It's nice being a new bowl of soup, isn't it? It's nice being a new jar of ointment. But that's only only person that can do that is God. You see, good works can't take the hair out. And good works can't take the flies out. The only one that can make a new soup and a new ointment is the Lord Jesus, our God. But wait a minute. There's another aspect of this power of the resurrection over sin. The power that God infuses into the believer's life that enables him or her to be free from the dominion of sin. (coughs) You understand that? When a person trusts Christ as their Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes to reside in them, and the book of Ephesians tells us that they are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. And he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So once you get saved and the Holy Spirit moves in and seals you, he seals you until the day of redemption. But now you have a power you didn't have before. Before you had human power, but now you've got the power of the resurrected Christ that lives within that can give you the power over sin in your practical everyday life. We don't have to be under the dominion of sin because we have the power of Christ. God has a two-step program for victory. Be saved, be filled. Be saved by grace, be filled with the Spirit, and you'll have the victory. What gave me power over cigarettes? What gave me power over alcohol? What gave me power over dope? What gave me power over pornography? What gave me power over swearing? What gave me power over a host of other delusive dominions of the mind and body? It wasn't because I rolled up my sleeves. It wasn't because I gave it a real good college try. It was the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ operating in my life. That's what gave me the victory. Not me. Him. Because without him, he said, I can do nothing. I have no power over sin without Jesus. But with Jesus, I can do all things through him that strengthens me. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power available to us who know him as Savior. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. 
For ye are not under the law, but under grace. The grace of God is available for us so that we don't have to be under the dominion of sin. That's the power of the resurrection. Paul said, I want to know that in my life. Paul said, I want to know that power. As I press forward, as I reach forth, he says, as I'm living my life, as I'm going forward, I want to know that power so that sin won't have a dominion. Now listen, I want to tell you something. Paul was a religious leader. Paul was a religious man. And Paul had all that pedigree and all that heritage, but he, was, he knew he was under the dominion of sin. He knew there were sins in his life he couldn't get victory over. There was a lifestyle that he was living that nobody else knew about. He knew in his heart of hearts that he did not have dominion over sin, and he wanted that power, and he knew it had to be the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection working in him. So resurrection power is the power over sin. But number two, resurrection power is the power over death. Death wields a mighty power over mankind. It's the single thing man fears the most. We spend billions and billions each year trying to ward off death, trying to cheat death. The medical field has made tremendous strides and is keeping us alive longer than ever before, enabling us to overcome unusual odds physically. But you know what? Even the medical field, as advanced as it is, can't do anything about death. Technology. Think of the technology we have today. We've got technology. If you've ever been to an emergency room, the technology in there is incredible. But even with all of our technology and all of our advances, we still cannot conquer death. Though we spend billions every year, we cannot conquer death. You've heard me talk about cryogenics. I can't help it. It's just a weird thing. You know what cryogenics is? Cryogenics is when they freeze your body before you die, hoping they can thaw you out when they find a cure for your disease. you got to be pretty scared to do something crazy like that. Amen? I'm so afraid to die, kill me. <laughs> but somebody sold them a bill of goods. Oh no, we'll... What do they think we're like? The fit we, we, they think we're like tropical fish. You know how they transport tropical fish? They transport them in ice, and their body temperatures go low, and their their uh, their bodies start to go down to hardly doing like a hibernation state. That, so they think they can do that with human beings. Guess what? There's a thing called a soul that human beings have that little fish don't have. You freeze a little fish, maybe you can bring it back. I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to. All I know is at the point another man wants to die, once you shut me down, you can't start me up again. Because it's appointed unto man how many times to die? Once. When your old heart starts ticking and your old brain stops uh, synapsing, guess what? You're dead. And you're not coming back until de resurrection day. But we'll do, we'll do crazy things like that as human beings. Why? Because we're afraid of death. I'm so afraid to die, just freeze me. What is it about death that gives it such power over our hearts and minds? The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who, here it is, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And so the Bible tells us here that we were held in bondage to death because of fear. That's the thing about death that makes it so powerful. We're afraid of it. We're afraid to die as human beings. What is about to fear? Well, maybe it's the, the finality of it that we fear. Maybe it's the unknown that man fears. He doesn't know what happens when you die. Nobody knows what happens when we die, except what the Bible tells us. Maybe that's why they're afraid. Or maybe it's the uncertainty of religion. The only religion, and that's not even a religion, it's a relationship. 
The only thing on planet Earth that can give you a no-so for sure, no questions about it, is Christianity. No other religion offers you that. Oh, if you do this, if you do that, maybe, maybe, oh, well, we'll wait and see. Not with us. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's exciting, isn't it? You see, when we trust Christ as our Savior, before we're saved, we have this, this human fear of death. But when we trust Christ as our Savior, we have a power over the dominion of that fear. We're not held bondage to that fear any longer. Because the power of the resurrection takes fear out of death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Wow, what is death? It's swallowed up in victory. When I die, I win. When I die, I enter into victory. When I leave this world, I'm going off to be with Jesus. Death. Swallow up. The world sees death like this. This great gaping mouth waiting to swallow everybody up. You know what God says? As big as death is, it's swallowed up by even something bigger. Victory. In Christ. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? You see, the power of the resurrection takes the sting out of death. O grave, where is thy victory? Takes the victory out of the grave. The sting of, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. We're not under the law. Didn't he say that? So there's no sting to my death because there's no law to condemn me. Because there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Listen, I don't want to die because God put, has put within me a desire to live. But I'm not afraid to die. I want to tell a story I've told a thousand times. It's just an awesome story to me. So I'm just going to tell it to me. I'm going to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, that's fine. But years ago, my wife and I, we were, we were it was nighttime and it was a Saturday night I, I, and we were getting ready to, well, we were in bed sleeping, and I had to get up, you know, go to the restroom, and I went in. All of a sudden, I felt really strange, and I fell down on the bathroom floor. I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. I was just laying there. And I thought I was having a heart attack. And, I, I, and so I said, okay, I just closed my eyes. I'm laying on the floor. I can't get up. I don't want to yell and bother her. She's sleeping. So I'm just laying there on the floor. And I said, Lord, here I come. This is it. I'm coming. And I opened my eyes, and I was still on the bathroom floor in my house. I was very disappointed. But I was glad at the same time. Well, I'm telling you that story to say this. I thought I was a dead man. I thought this was it. I'm leaving this old earth. I'm dying. But there was no fear. There was an absolute absence of fear. I didn't want to, I wasn't saying, oh no, oh, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, oh no, I'm going to die. No, none of that. It was just like, okay, Lord, this is it, I'm ready, I'm coming home, here we go. Isn't that awesome? What can give you that? The power of the resurrection. The reality that I have, I have victory over death in Jesus Christ. The grave couldn't keep him, and it isn't going to keep you either, if you know Christ is your Savior. Because you have the righteousness, Paul said, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The resurrection power. Again, the truth makes us free, doesn't it? Death has lost its power on us because we're risen with Christ. In Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second who is he that overcometh, John said? Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the Bible has promised me I'm not going to be hurt by the second death. 
The Bible has promised me because I'm an overcomer. How am I an overcomer? Because I believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior. Boy, that's the power of the resurrection, isn't it? You know, if you watch the reactions of religionists, their reaction to death, and what any, any religion, whatever it is, except biblical Christianity, you're going to witness an almost hysterical sorrow. Have you ever noticed that? If you ever watched a news clip or a video, uh, some people of other different religions, and somebody dies, they scream, they yell, they cry, they throw themselves on the casket, they can't walk, they're oh, all that stuff. But you go to a funeral of a born-again Christian, there's none of that going on. You know what Paul wrote to Thessalonians? He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And listen to what he says this. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Paul said, I know you don't like to see loved ones go. I know you, you, you don't like to see them die, and I know it brings a certain sorrow, but we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. Why? Because we have hope. And we know that those who we have loved, who have known Christ as their Savior and died, we're going to see them again. That's our hope. The hope of the resurrection. That's the power of the resurrection over death. It takes the sting out of death. It takes the power out of the grave. It takes the fear out of death. And number three, the power of the resurrection is the power over hell. Now, the truth is, most people do not know for sure where they're going to spend eternity. If you would go out and randomly ask people, if they know for sure they're gonna, where they're going to go when they die, most people, probably, I don't know, 90% or more, would say, no, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. Or they might say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven, or I think I'm going to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven if they believe in heaven and hell, right? Nobody wants to go to hell. Oh, yeah, I'm going to hell, can't wait. Everybody wants to think they're going to heaven. Everybody wants to hope they're going to heaven. But how many know they're going to heaven? That's the question. Very few. Some even say that they do not believe in an eternity of consciousness. However, they lie. They do lie. For in those private moments, they know deep down inside, they know an eternity awaits them. And deep down somewhere inside, they know they have to meet their creator face to face. And I believe with all my heart, the staunchest atheist knows deep inside the reality that there is a God that they're going to answer to. When the Lord Jesus was on earth, he preached more about hell than he did heaven. Why do you think he did that? Because he doesn't want anyone to go there. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, the Lord doesn't want anybody to go to hell, but the reality is, he talked about a broad way and a narrow way, and he said the broad way, there are many, many on the broad way that leads to destruction. He said there are few on the narrow way that lead to life. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus said it. Jesus believed in hell because he's God and he knows all things. And he said, you know what? Don't worry about men. All they can do is hurt your body. You need to worry about God. Look with me, if you would, in Revelation chapter 21. Just turn there real quick. We're almost done. Revelation chapter 21. Look with me at verse 8. We're talking about hell. We're talking about Eternal lake of fire. Look with me in Revelation 21.8. It says, here's the people who are going there. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Remember I told you earlier we've all sinned? Have you ever told a lie in your life? I mean, just one lie. Have you ever told one single lie? You know what that makes you? It makes you a liar. How many murders do you have to commit to be a murderer? How many lies you got to tell to be a liar? 
It said here all liars have their part in this lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The lake of fire, commonly referred to as hell, is God's eternal prison house for souls that have sinned or committed crimes against God and His kingdom. The power of the resurrection is the power and authority of Jesus Christ to acquit, to pardon those who have trusted in Him. The power to deliver us from the wrath to come. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. This is called the great white throne judgment. This is the appearance of all those who have never trusted Christ as their Savior before Him at their final judgment. Look what it says. And I saw a great white throne, and Him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want you to notice there's a couple of different books here. First of all, there are the books. You see that? And the books were opened. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. According to their works. What is, this is the books of works. And so here is an unsaved person. Might be a man, might be a woman. They stand before God. And God opens the books of the works of their life. And he opens the book. And the Bible says they're judged out of the things that are written in the books. You know what's in the books? Your sin, your unrighteous acts, your evil thoughts, your wicked words, your lies, your deceits, the time you cheated, the time you stole, all those things are all written in the book of works. And what is the purpose of them being judged out of the book of works? Because the books of works condemn them. It shows you are worthy of the punishment you're going to receive. No one's going to stand before God and say, well, I didn't do that. Well, I didn't say that. I didn't go there. He's going to open the book and say, yes, you did. Here on January 27th, 1977, this is where you went, and that's what you did. right here in the book. Wow. The book of works is to prove there's, to them it's like the testimony of their life that they're sinners deserving of the punishment they're going to receive. But then there's another book. It's called the book of life. And it says in verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so the book of works will condemn them even the religious. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So here are people who prophesied in the name of Jesus. They were teachers, they were preachers, they were rabbis, they were whatever, all kinds of religious leaders. And uh, they did it all in the name of Jesus. And he said, you're a worker of iniquity. Why? Because you didn't do the will of my Father. What's the will of the Father? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Honor the Son is the will of the Father. No, 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 you wanted your religion. No, 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 you wanted your works. No, 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 you wanted your own self-righteousness. So no, you don't, you're not in the book of life. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You don't have eternal life because you never accepted eternal life by trusting Jesus who is the life. So your name's not in the, in the book of life. So you have to be cast in the lake of fire. And the book of works proves that you deserve to go there. That God is just and holy to sentence you there. You understand? But you know what the power of the resurrection does? It gives me victory over all that. Do I have, listen. 
Are there any, is there anything in my life that isn't perfect and holy? Mm -hmm. But my name's in the book of life. You understand? People say, well, you know, um, you, you tell me that a, a person can get saved and then they can sin and still go to heaven? Yeah, their name's in the book of life. You see? But you can do all the good works you want to do, and if you don't trust Christ your Savior, your name's not in the book of life. You don't get in. You see, the books of works gives clarity the meaning of, I, of Isaiah 64, 6, where it says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And the book of life, Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. A person has their name found in the book of life only if they have received the gift of eternal life by faith in him who is life, the Lord Jesus Christ. For that person, the power of the resurrection is the power over eternity in hell. Only a person who has been born again by the Spirit of God can have and know the experience of the power of the resurrection over sin. The power of the resurrection over death. And the power of the resurrection over hell is for those who have trusted Christ and have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Paul said, that's the kind of life I want to live. A life full of the power of the resurrection, power over sin, power over the fear of death, and power and confidence, knowing that my name is in the Lamb's book of life, and I'll never be in danger of going to hell. <coughs> I ask you, dear Christian, what kind of life do you want to live? A life of power? A life of freedom? A powerful life of confidence and victory? A life that demonstrates the power of the resurrection? The more you know him, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the more you know Jesus, the more you'll know the power of the resurrection in your life. And maybe you're here tonight or watching or listening, listen, you've never been saved, where are you going to spend eternity? You can deny it or you can put it off dealing with it, but one day it'll be too late. The only time to prepare for eternity is while you're alive on planet Earth and can exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your works will prove that the punishment is just. And only Christ can forgive your sins and give you the gift of eternal life by faith. What are you waiting for? A more convenient time? How could there be a more convenient time than now? How could there be a more convenient place than here? Don't wait for tomorrow, because tomorrow may be too late. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If there's anyone in this room tonight who says, I really have never settled that with the Lord Jesus, and I am not sure I'm going to heaven. I'd like to go to heaven, but I'm not sure. And I would like to be sure. Would you lift your hand up? Just let me see it. Say, here am I, preacher. I'm not going to ask you to do, walk forward or do anything you don't want to do. Just want to pray for you. Anybody like that here tonight? Say, pray for me, preacher. <clears throat> I'm really not all that sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Anybody like that here? Father, we thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. And it's a practical thing for us as believers. For we have the power of the resurrection in our lives. And Paul said that's the life he wanted to live with power over sin and power over the fear of death and power over hell that gives him confidence. And I pray, my Father, you'd help us tonight as we think about this power, that it might be operative in our lives. Father, we might be victors here because one day we'll be total victors there. Help us in this invitation. Guide and direct it, my Father. We'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing our closing hymn. Uh, closing hymn is number 412, 412. And I want to ask you tonight, we're going to sing moment by moment. And that's how